Ephesians chapter 2. We're, we're, we're going to get there in, in just a minute, but I figured I'd give you a head start if you're unfamiliar with your, your, your Bible. Head to the New Testament and take a right. Galatians, Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, now, this, this story is, is, is not about me, but uh, about a preacher that I know. So those of you that know me go, no, I can see you doing this. It is absolutely possible, but I, 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 this isn't me. Um, preacher that I, I, I met who in seminary had one day, uh, um, he, he was in his dorm room, hit his book bag, and the syllabus to the class that he was, one of the classes he was taking fell out. Literally, the syllabus fell out, and he looked and saw it, and realized he had a paper due the next day. And he was like, oh my. You know, and this is the kind of guy that typically uh, would, would turn his papers in late. So he's like, hey man, I got a chance to get this done on time. I'm going to knock this out of the park. And like most um, young Bible college students, having been one before, I, you're, you're pretty convinced that your stuff is a whole lot better than what it really is. And that your writing is much more profound than what it really is. So he went and he wrote this paper and turned it in on time and kind of had that idea, you know, as he's talking to the professor, man, you ain't even got to read this. Just go ahead and put an A on it and, 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 and we'll move on. And the next week he came back and they handed the papers back out and flips to the back page and there's a great big red F, and it said, great content, wrong assignment. <laughs> he thought he had this knocked out, but turned in the, 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 the wrong assignment. And I say that, not, not to, to, to poke fun at him, but one day I will, and particularly church leaders, I'll speak to you for a second, particularly church leaders, those who have been in church leadership, those who will be in church leadership, one day we stand before God. And you know what I don't want to hear? Great content, wrong assignment. And you, you, you stand there and you, and you go, but we did this really well. We had the, the best music around and we had this program. And I had this Bible study where I taught people funny little Greek verbs. And we did all that and I can almost see God saying, did you read the syllabus? The content was great, but none of that's what I asked you to do. So as Thrive Church is getting started... As, as we're, 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 we're like a, a, a kid right now who's just starting to ride, got the training wheels on, and as we're getting started, what we have to do is to make sure that we're doing what God has assigned for us to do. Make sure that the church is taking steps um, as we should. As a matter of fact, I commented to someone just a little bit ago. I said, um, Thrive Church, however well we get this, this, these, these six weeks will, will determine how much we really do thrive. If we don't get this, we'll, we'll, we'll just struggle. And we'll just be a milquetoast side of the road church. God's called us to something different. God's called us to something greater than that. And so we have to, as a church, start to go back and to see what is it that God's called us to do because as we get this as a church, we'll also get this as individuals and our personal lives will thrive. And as our personal lives thrive in what God's assigned for us to do, the church will thrive as well. It starts all the way, in, all the way back in Genesis. What did God tell Adam to do? Go out multiply. It goes bad there shortly thereafter because Adam does the same stuff that you and I would have done and he messed it all up. So God starts everything over with Noah and what does he tell Noah? Go out, multiply. Well, we, we even see the, the, the struggles that happen there. We get to the New Testament. Jesus comes in as we just sang. He pays it all. And then what does he say? He doesn't say, stay here. He says, go. Go out, multiply. 
Here's God's plan for, for fixing the earth, for, for making the earth what he's intended for. It is to fill it with Jesus, and he's planning on filling it with Jesus by sending the church. That's his plan for how this will work. And last week, we, we looked at Ephesians chapter 1, and we saw that this, this same power that rose Jesus from the dead fills the church now. And the church's job is to take the beauty of Jesus into homes and schools and neighborhoods and workplaces and to, to take that out everywhere. And that means that we have to refocus a bit and we have to change the way that we see church. When a church is... By the way, when I say this, these sorts of things, I'm not ever critical of another church. I'm critical of me. Because I've done it all wrong. And through the, the years in the process, God's been reforming how I've come to see church. You see, when a church is small and, 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 and it's dying, the, it, it, you tend to say this, would you please stay? Please stay. We're, we're going to get this enacted. We're going to get this figured out. We're, we're, we're going to do this. As a church gets healthy, it, it, it's please come. Hey, come check out what we got going on. Come, come see what this looks like. When a church gets biblical, it says please go. It moves past the, the please stay to the please come, and it goes, no, here's what it looks like. It's to go out so that every person who calls this home realizes this isn't the source of where our ministry happens. This is where we just come to be together and to encourage one another and to love on one another and to sing. Ministry happens out there. And it's never going to be about what can we build. Hey, come be a part of what we're doing. It's always going to be about, hey, what can, how can we resource you? How can we help you? How can we help you to be the masterpiece that God's designed for you to be in your home, in your workplace, in your school? Because that echoes what we see the New Testament talking about. And so six shifts. We, we, we started this last week, and we're, we're, we're going to, to look at these again. Last week, we started with less effort and more Jesus. These are the, the shifts that we have to make if we're going to be the church and be the people that God have called us to be. Less effort, more Jesus. Today, less volunteers and more masterpieces. Well, I'm not going to stop there because I'm going to spend the rest of the day talking about it. So next week, less, less guilt more love. After that, it'll be less hierarchy and more missionaries, then less programs and more mission fields, and then less strategy and more surrender. Remember, we'll be the church that God has called us to be as we get these things and as we refocus our minds to what he's designed the church to be and, and, and how to, to live. And, and, and today we're going to talk a bit about what this looks like. And I know that the, the question is going to be, well, how are you going to get there? Honestly, we don't know. Planting a church is a lot like running with scissors. Sooner or later, you're going to get hurt. But the thing is, is, we're not going to stop there. We're going to get up and we're going to try it again and we're going to keep going because here's what we have to do. We have to know what right looks like. And we'll just keep trying and keep trying and keep trying until we get to what that is. And it may take a week, it may take two years, but we're going to continue to keep working as we get to that. And we'll be praying more than ever. I, I, I was watching a, a show the other day on, on the life of... C.S. Lewis, and it so struck me, a comment that he made, and it, it came from one of his books, but seeing it kind of in the movie really, really hit me. And he said, I pray all the time anymore because I can't help myself. It just comes out of me. And it doesn't change God, it changes me. See, as the church, as we learn that supernatural is the new normal, and as we go as far as fast as we can go on our knees and we're praying and we're praying for God to provide and for God to take care of this and to push us forward, supernatural will become the new normal. Ephesians chapter 2. What we're going to do here is, is I'm going to scan 
this, this text to get to the place where we need to focus. And I, I'll be honest with you, I almost feel bad scanning this text because Ephesians chapter 2 is one of the most beautiful passages in, in, in Scripture. So I'm just going to hit the highlights, hit the, the, the mountaintops of it as we land where we're going to be today with less volunteers and more masterpieces. And I say, I say that I, I, I've got to preach this first to myself because I, I've always had the, the, the nag method of volunteer management. It's N is, is I've got a need, and A is I cost someone, and G is I guilt them into it. Jesus wants you to do this, right? That's, that's the way that we fill our roles oftentimes because we set up programs and then use people to fill a predetermined program. And it may be that God wants us to do church a little differently. Now, when I say that, I, I, I don't mean that we don't need volunteers. Because the church runs on volunteers. There have to be people in kids' ministry. There have to be people at the front door smiling and not have to. We get to do that. But that is not the sum total of what it means to, to work for God, to, for this to be a lifestyle. Who you are in the church... I was just having a conversation this morning with a friend who was talking about just growing up in the church. And he's like, I had my Sunday version. And then the, the week looked very, very different. And I'm here to tell you this. When we get that there's no such thing as a Sunday version of who we are, we'll begin to become the church that we're designed to be because God calls us to be His 24-7, all day, every day. And that is when life gets good. It becomes a shift. Well, let's get, we'll get into the text now as, as we look at this. There becomes this shift of um, anybody from Home Depot. Their, their, their motto is this, is you can build it, we can help. See, the church often we have this idea of we can build it, why don't you come help? We need to flip that around so that we realize that ministry happens away from here. You can do this. You can do what God's designed you to be. We'll help you get there. See, it's time to rethink a few things. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. I'm going to read verses 1 through 3. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you previously lived according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the disobedient. We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out uh, the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts, and we were by nature under wrath as others were also. Here's the prognosis that Paul starts with, and, and no one likes this, but he, he starts with the word dead. My life apart from Christ is dead. With Christ, there's new life, but uh, uh, apart from Christ, just walking around dead. I remember uh, I had the, the, this tree in, in, in my front yard that uh, it, it had some funky disease going on in it, and I could tell something was wrong. I called my buddy Kevin, who knows more about trees than any person on the planet. I said, dude, what, what's the deal with that tree? He said, that tree's dead. You can't cut it down fast enough. I'm like, no, I like this tree. It's still got some leaves. It still looks pretty. He said, Steve, listen to me. It's dead. There's nothing you can do for that tree. It's dead. That's the same kind of dead that Paul talks about my heart apart from Jesus. And you can go and look it up in the Greek, and you know what dead means? Dead. There's no way around that. He says it's, it's, it's dead. But look, verse 4. But God, who's rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with Christ even as we were dead in trespasses. You are saved by grace. Oh, he also raised us up with him and seated us in, in the heavens in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might display the immeasurable, immeasurable pardon me, riches of his grace through his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. I, I think those are the two best words in Scripture. Dead, but God. 
But God wasn't willing to leave you and I there. He wasn't willing to to leave us there. He made us alive in Christ Jesus. And and I hear people say this oftentimes. So when I say this, you're going, someone's going to go, well, he's saying that because I said that to him. And I'm here to tell you 25 people have said this to me. People say, I don't have a good testimony. I don't don't have a, a good testimony. And I'm going, hold on. If I understand Scripture right, you were dead and now you're alive. That's a pretty great testimony. I didn't have life, but now I do in Christ Jesus. That's something completely different. There there was death, and now there's life. And Paul draws attention to two elements here. Uh, Pay attention to the adjectives here. Rich in mercy, great love, immeasurable riches. Paul wants you and I to, to see God's character poured out. So it's poured out on us. Here, let me get theological for you for a second. God the Father is love, is what Scripture says. For there to be love, there has to be an object of love. That object of love is the Son. The Father pours His love out on the Son. Since you and I belong to Him, since we've been saved and we're part of Him, we get that love as well. Do you realize that the Father loves you in the same way that He loves His Son, Jesus? Man, that is a testimony that just keeps telling itself. The Father loves you in that same kind of way. And, and it, it says that He seated us with, in Christ Jesus in the heavenly realms. Uh, a couple of years ago, I had a chance to have dinner to, at, at a place where, honestly, someone had gave me a gift card. I've got no business going there. I can't afford anything there. But we were there having this, this ridiculously big steak. And I didn't notice that the uh, NFL pre-draft camp was going on downtown at the time. And, I, you know, since I'm not the most observant dude, I didn't notice that there were every guy in the room was like 300 pounds. I mean, it's just all these doors walking around. So I'm sitting there having dinner, and there's a guy talking. I mean, his, his chair is maybe four feet from mine. And he's talking about football in a way that people don't talk about. I mean, he's talking about, hey, this guy's got this speed and lateral acceleration. And I'm like... Finally, it's driving me nuts. I turn around, I'm like, who in the world is this? So I spin around, and Jerry Jones is sitting right here. I'm like, Tracy, that's Jerry Jones. And she's like, I don't care who's Jerry Jones. And I'm like, he's like a billionaire, and he's a jerk. <laughs> and she's like, I still don't care. And I'm like, no, you don't, you don't get it. That guy owns the Dallas Cowboys. And so, of course, I'm now paying attention because I'm hanging out with Jerry Jones. It's like we're best friends. I've been over to his house, you know, for Thanksgiving. No, he was faced the other way. But we're sitting there, and I start to pay attention. And everyone that came along, he was, honestly, he was the, one of the most polite guys that I've ever been around. He was so uh, uh, kind to people, and everyone there, he's, have you met my son? Have you, have you met my son? And he just kept introducing, because 30 people came over, and he's like, oh, I'm so glad to meet you. Have you met my son? That's the way that God looks at you, seated in the heavenly realms. He's proud, and he loves you, and he's got so much for you. And he's like, have you seen my son? Have you seen my kid? Look at him. He's like a proud dad when he looks at us, not because... He sees what you and I have done, but because he sees what Jesus has done on our behalf. Once we start to get this position that we have, everything else changes. So just uh, put this together, move from death to life. And I didn't just move from death to life, but I moved from death to life to becoming a child of God. So I get to have a seat at God's table And notice that that's a picture that's used all through the New Testament. Get to have a a seat at God's table, and he says, look at my boy. Mine. Get this Christian. Get this Christian. If you know Jesus as Lord, you have a prized position in God. He loves you, and he uh, uh, cherishes you. A life that thrives gets that. A church that thrives is a bunch of people that get that. Look at, look, look at verse 8. 
For you are saved by grace through faith. And this is not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. Not from works so that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he prepared ahead of time for us to do. So God's gift here is what? It's life. Go back to it. It's death apart from Christ. It's new life in Christ. That life is a gift that is received by faith. In other words, when you come to trust Jesus as Lord, that gift is is put in you. Not just put in you, but it remakes you. Paul talks about the old is gone, the new has come. And there were new critters in Christ Jesus. And this is so important. Because I didn't earn it. I can't brag about it. You know, we, we as people ha- have a tendency to want to brag about what we've accomplished. You know what? I'm a self-made man. I did this. I pulled myself up from my bootstraps. Nobody helped me. I got this and I got this. Let me tell you something. If you get the gospel, you realize we didn't have bootstraps. We didn't have anything. What we have is Jesus. And no one can boast standing in the shadow of the cross. Because you see the price, you see the pain, you see the blood, and you realize that it's not that God just erased a board and said, hey, I'm going to give you a second chance. He came in and lived a life that you and I would refuse to, to live so he could die a death that we deserved so that you and I could have a seat at the table. Let me tell you something, that doesn't get any better. Paul says we're his Workmanship. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you, if, if you look at uh, the NLT, it says we're his masterpieces. We're his masterpieces. In other words, uh, Michelangelo made the statue David. God makes you. He makes you just the way that you are. A masterpiece with a very specific purpose. Um, baseball bats are made to do what? Hit baseballs, not bunt. Bunting is wrong. (laughs) Baseball bats are made to hit baseballs. Corvettes are made to what? Get your tickets. That's what they're there for. Christians are made for good works that God designed for you and I before we were ever born. Plans that he had for you before you ever took a breath. He saw you and he knew you and he said, I, I, I've got this for you. You're his masterpiece. And as we start to get that, it changes life. How many times have you ever been uh, in, in one of those scenarios where you're like, man, what's the purpose? What's the purpose to all this? It doesn't seem to have meaning. Well, let me tell you something. As a Christian, you have profound meaning. Christians are made for good works. And if you are a follower, follower of Jesus, you have Profound purpose and incredible beauty, the way that he made you. God doesn't look at you and say, I would love you if you got this in order. God doesn't look at you and say, if you, just, if you would just cut that out. Oh, there's plenty of stuff in our lives we need to cut out. But he looks at you and he says, I love you. I made you this way and I made you for this purpose. Paul says that we're masterpieces. See, every follower of Jesus is designed to be a unique masterpiece that God has designed them uh, to be within the context of a healthy biblical community of faith. He's designed us to be with one another. He's designed us to, to have this church together and to have a purpose. Your life is called to a purpose, a a ministry. Remember, it's not that we were called to simply do something on Sunday as important as doing something on Sunday is. We're called for this to, to work through every aspect of our lives. I, I, I'm going to say this, and it's probably going to get me in trouble, but I'm going to say it anyways. Because sometimes I find that the church is very good at Bible studies and very poor at biblical worldview. 
So in other words, we don't mind doing the studies and we don't mind learning about the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Chigarbites and everybody else. But what we forget to do is to realize that that changes the way that I look at the news. And it changes the way that I talk to my kids. And it changes the way that I talk to my wife. And it changes the way that I go to work. It changes literally everything. It's, it's, it's moving from this realm here to seeing through here. Because once I learn to see through here, I'll see everything else differently. Becoming a Christian is not about getting out of hell. Becoming a Christian is about stepping into this purpose that God designed for me. Let me tell you something. And then we get to spend eternity with him. That's the bonus. But he didn't just come so that we would have life then. He came so we would have life now. Far, far too long, the church has talked about, oh, that young man's called. We talk about calling as though it's something for a select few. And l- l- let me tell you, that is an, it's like an anaconda around the throat of the church choking it out because everyone who knows Jesus as Lord is called to ministry. Everyone who knows Jesus is called to a ministry. And we've got to stop thinking about, oh, that young man's called and start to realize that everyone in here is called. Everyone in here has a profound purpose. You're a masterpiece. You're a masterpiece that God has created. Now, you may be living in complete rebellion to what that is, and it may be some things that we have to turn around, but God designed you for a purpose. He's called you to a ministry. Jesus didn't tell just a few people to go. He tells all to do that. This church, any church, We don't have to have a plan for how we're going to reach the community. We don't have to have a strategy for how we're going to reach the world because it's already here. God's already placed us in the community. You live in a certain spot. That's where ministry is supposed to happen. Remember, he, he, God's design is to fill this earth. Think about water filling an aquarium. Every nook and cranny, everywhere, covered everywhere with Jesus. How does he do that? By putting Christians there. That's our task. By putting Christians in those spots. Remember, his plan is to fill the world with Jesus. And to do that, he's sending a church. That's God's plan A. And when you're God, you don't have to have plan B. That's the way that he works. (coughs) You aren't just saved from, th- from something, you're saved to something. Remember, it's God's plan to fill the world with Jesus. That means that, means that God is filling houses with Jesus and neighborhoods with Jesus and elementary schools with Jesus and carpenter union halls with Jesus and dentist office with Jesus Everywhere there are people, the design is that there would be Jesus via the church. You want to see how a country will change. You want to see how an area will change. Have the church be the church there. That's why we have to stop this idea of come and see, and we've got to really drill in on this. Hey, go and be. Go be the church where you're at. And watch him, watch him turn around neighborhoods and car dealerships and schools. You see, God is strategically and purposefully placing you and I in each place. Having, having planned good works, having planned good works before you and I were born. He knew you and he planned for us to do something. Thrive Church, if you call this church home, please, please, please hear me on this. We've got to lean in on this. We've got to lean in on this. God didn't call us to build something spectacular. He called us to spread the church. This is where we come together and sing and love one another. And and maybe even get to introduce some people to the gospel. But our ministry is out there. Our work is out there. You know where it starts? In our living rooms. In your living room. And in your 
workplace, in your block, wherever you're at, and you watch Jesus do what only Jesus can do. Because remember, he's the one who's doing all this. This isn't us. You know, it, one of the things about the way that, that Thrive is set up, we, we really only have five different areas where people can, can, can volunteer. We're, we're running lean intentionally. You know, it's, it's, there's worship, hospitality, kids, students. I'm missing one. That's why I'm supposed to my, stay near my notes. Oh, and set up. Hey, we get to start that again this week. And set up. That's really it. And, and, and hear, hear me on this. There will never be a time prayerfully where we're like, hey, let's add another ministry and let's add this and let's add this and let's add this and let's make this more complicated because the work is out there. We want to be lean and mean here. We want to be able to, to keep this simple. So if you ever catch me or uh, anyone else in leadership going, hey, let's complicate this. Let's make this a little bigger. Let's make this a little better. Hit the brakes. It needs to be bigger and better out there. We come to worship in here. We just come to, to, to be one another. And, and it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be a show. Because our work's always going to be out there. Amen. That's what we're trying to lean in on. Remember, it's, it can't be we can build it, you can help. It needs to be you can do this. We'll help you. We'll help you. So a, a, as, as time goes forward here, we'll start to work on like, hey, what's, what's personal calling look like? What's it mean for me to, to maybe take the, the gifts that God's given me and, and the experiences that I've had and what are my passions and how do those combine into something that is the masterpiece that God's designed each one of us to be? Because when you get that, when you get that, man, special things happen. Then supernatural becomes the new normal. You know what we don't want to do? We don't want to create unnatural scenarios for you to act unnaturally. Right. Those, those scenarios where, where, where it's, hey, let's do this and, and we'll have the preacher do this. Or, or let's, let's have a revival where every one of us, we're going to get trained on you know, the, the, the four spiritual laws and we'll go and we'll present that. No, 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 no. Go represent Jesus in your home. Do it in your work. And you'll watch because we live in a time, we live in a post-Christian society. Make sure you get this. We live in a post-Christian society. There are more Christians south of the equator than there are north of the equator. And that's the first time that's happened in a thousand years. And the missiologists will say, uh, the, the church folks uh, that, that study this say that's an irreversible trend. They'll say, that is the way this is. And you know what? Honestly, all I want to do is see the church grow. See people come to know Jesus, whether it's here or there. But wherever he's planted people is where his work is. You can do it. We can help. Created masterpieces built for work that that he designed for you, not for the person sitting next to you, for you. I'm going to tell you a story about Andy. Uh, Andy lives in Kansas City. Andy uh, works for a movie theater chain. And he's, he was like the director of HR. And they, they came to Andy and said, hey, let, how can we meaningfully hire folks with disabilities? Here, this is your task. And, you know, it was one of those, he was like, great, I needed something else to do. It kept getting pushed back, and he kept getting pushed back, and he kept getting pushed back. And the minister at his church started talking to him about, hey, man, God has created you to do spectacular things. You're God's masterpiece. In his Bible study, he comes across Proverbs 31, 8, and 9. Speak up for those who have no voice. For the justice of all who are dispossessed, speak up. Uh, judge righteously. <laughs> I'll get this in a second. Righteously. And defend the cause of the oppressed and the needy. And he said, fine. God, if this is what you want me to do. So he came up with an idea for their movie theater. 
to meaningfully hire folks with disabilities. It, it, it got so big that it became a national program with that one movie theater. Now he's gone to where he's been asked to go and to talk to Google about how they did that. And they brought him to the White House to talk about how do we do this. And now he's actually left and it's a full-time ministry for him. And there were like, like 20,000 jobs were created for folks who wouldn't have this job because someone realized that God had something for them to do. Now, get this, sometimes it's going to be on a big scale, and other times it'll be something that no one else even knows about. Either way, you're a masterpiece created, designed by God for a purpose, for a purpose. And I can hear the, I, 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 I hear the difficulty. Man, I'm too old to be starting that now. Let me, let me cut that out of the way. Because if you are, got a few more. I, I got the gray hairs. I got my Albus Dumbledore starter kit here. So I, I get this. Let me tell you something. If you are older, you probably have more time, uh, more wisdom. And frankly, you may even have more disposable income than you ever have. Don't waste your retirement years. Spend them on the gospel. Live the gospel. And you, you go, well, you don't know about the struggles that I've had because I've had this problem and I've had this problem and I get that addiction and abuse and struggles are real, but I'm here to tell you, if you'll take those scarred hands and you'll, you'll lay them in Christ's hands, He'll do something more than you can ever imagine with it. Give it to Him. Don't assume that you should sit on the sidelines because honestly, you may have more credibility than, than most in a certain area. And God will do spectacular things with that. And I, I, I also, I, I, this is the third objection here. Man, I missed my chance. Well, let me tell you something. The, the, let's cut through that pretty quick because one of the greatest sicknesses a church can ever have is a small vision of Jesus. And if we go... Oh, I missed my chance. Well, let, let's, do, let's see how that works out. If I missed my chance, that means that, gosh, I, maybe I should have dated this girl in school instead of this girl, and I picked the wrong ones, which means I married the wrong gal, which means I have the wrong kids, which means everything's been wrong since the third grade. Jesus is a whole lot bigger than that, and he's a whole lot better than that. He knows where you are, and he knows where every step of your life has been. And he says, you're my masterpiece. I've got stuff for you. Amen. Let that dig in. What an exciting time to be a Christian. I'm, 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 I'm quickly, I, I find that I quickly run out of time. L -l Listen, you and I live in a post-Christian society, which means that uh, nominal Christianity is dead. It's gone. There, were, there was a time when there were a lot of folks who, who said they were Christians but really weren't. Now, now, now we, there's, there's Christians and there's more of us that aren't. Well, I'm going to tell you something. It makes the mission field a whole lot clearer. It makes our work a whole lot clearer. And don't you think for a second, don't you buy the hype that God isn't still doing spectacular things. I'm going to show you. Can I show you a picture? This Okay, you, you, you see this. I, I'm going to tell you there's 65,000 people here. 65,000. The average uh, Colts game is 61,000. So this is bigger than a Colts game. These are 18 to 25-year-olds, New Year's Eve, choosing to bring in New Year's Eve worship in Jesus. Amen. What a time. What a time God's placed us in. Now, here, it, something cool they did. This is called the Passion Conference. They lit, they lit a, a, a lamp in Jerusalem, or actually in Bethlehem, the birthplace of Christianity, and they, they brought it. I don't know how in the world you keep a lamp lit from there to here, but young people don't come up with excuses. They find ways to do things. So they, they brought it here, and the idea was that every one of 65,000 would learn to take this light, this beauty of Christianity into their world. Imagine what happens if 65,000 people get the gospel and get that this goes out. It doesn't come here. It goes out. What if only half of them? What if 10% of them 6,500 then, going out and taking Jesus into a lost and broken world. 
Oh, man, you turn an area upside down. Hey, let, let, let's make this purple. Or purple. Let's make this purple. Let's make this personal. I was giving Dan a hard time. What happens if the people in this room take this serious? What happens if we get that God has created you to be a masterpiece? Not to just to shine here, but to shine in your living room. We'll do something special.